This conference will now be recorded. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. We have a couple of special guests with us joining us today for our surprise episode of Quarantine. Thank you, Carl and Tracy, for so much for taking the time to hang out with us. Um, we always introduce ourselves on our episodes, including with our preferred pronouns, so that we're normalizing people identifying themselves for themselves and sharing with others how they'd like to be referred to upfront. So my name is Mitch Lee. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm one of the LGBTQ coordinators at Family Counseling. I'm Amy Baviars. I use she, her, her pronouns, and I am the other coordinator for the LGBTQ program. And Carl. Carl, uh, well, I'm actually a, a clinical therapist uh, and also a local pastor. I, I'm a, I, uh, Oaks Quarters Presbyterian Church is my little church, which I love so much. And I'm also a, a therapist for uh, CPS, uh, Ch Ch Child Protective Services in Ontario County. So uh, uh, I got my pronouns, him, he, is that? Yes. yes. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> and Tracy. Hi, I'm Tracy Matrano. I'm she, hers, and glad to be here. Thanks. We're so excited to have you. You can take it away. All right. So we're super stoked to have you join us during Pride Month. Um, so with Pride changing to an online format and lots of places, uh, really having to dig deep to find ways to still celebrate, still keeping safe, uh, we've led to a lot of our conversations by asking people, what does Pride mean to you? Mm. Well, I'm 62 years old, and I grew up in a very conservative, Italian, Irish, Catholic uh, environment. I went to Catholic schools, uh, much of which I'm very proud of and believe it gave me a good foundation. However, on some issues and the uh, LGBTQ issues, the Catholic Church is uh, not where I needed it to be for my own sense of identity and relationships um, as I grew into my young adulthood and, and charted out my life. So I am no longer uh, in the Catholic Church, by the way. I'm a member of the Episcopal Church. And I had a very important relationship uh, with a classmate of mine from when we were 15 at an all-girls Catholic high school until we were 21 years old. But it was very complicated and tortured because we couldn't share any of that with our families. And we loved our families. It wasn't an alienation from our families or our background or any part of that. You know, we, we made sauce together. We ate pasta. We had pizza on Saturday nights and ate a cold Sunday morning. I mean, we were all part of kind of a whole generation of people that were growing up in the 60s and 70s, but we just fell in love with each other and it was very real. Um, I uh, went on in my life and did marry a man uh, and he was a good man and it was a good marriage. We have two beautiful children, Nico and Sam. And uh, unfortunately the marriage did not last, however, and then subsequently I um, married a uh, woman who is the uh, director of religious and spiritual life at the University of Rochester. Uh, because we couldn't put our careers together, uh, we actually uh, separated and divorced. And now I'm in a relationship with uh, Vicki Everett, who's a kindergarten teacher in Watkins Glen Elementary. Uh, she has four children, two boys, two girls. Uh, my two boys uh, were a blended family, and, and I'm very grateful. So it, it, it's been a journey, and I think for different generations, it, it's maybe a different journey, but it's always a journey, and it is always a struggle. And it is so deeply personal, and yet it is something that is public and all a part of us. Thanks. I love that. We are ourselves both locally grown advocates from the Finger Lakes region ourselves. Um, I myself am a Cuca College alumni, so mm -hmm. I'm very, very partial to the Y-shaped lake. Um, I especially love canoeing down there. Do you have a favorite Finger Lake and what's your favorite fart part about it? Well, oh gosh, I'm totally prejudiced on this point. I am on Cuca Lake. The first college I taught at as a graduate student, Cuca College, and that was oh, back awesome. in 1984. I taught American history wow. parts two, fall, spring semester, and I remember falling in love with this area then. I used to drive in from Binghamton where I was in graduate school, 
in the Endicott area. And uh, I would just come here and just think, wow, this is heaven. When I was growing up in Rochester and in my father's restaurant where, you know, you work really, really hard, I used to beg my parents, couldn't we please get something on some water, you know, Lake Ontario mm -hmm. or one of the Finger Lakes. And uh, even later in life, when my parents had worked very hard and saved some money, my father would say something like, well, I suppose we could afford it, but we'd never have any time to do anything there. So I put all of that together. And uh, actually, when I just mentioned um, my uh, ex-wife, she was the rector at St. Mark's Episcopal Church here in Penyan. And that oh, is how, wow. yeah, I got, uh, she's now at the University of Rochester, but but then uh, she was here in Penyan. And uh, that's how we got here and I stayed and I, and I truly love it. So, and my favorite part of the lake is not where we are, but it's the Y, where the Y meets. So you've got yes. this goes down to Hammonds Port, you've got Branch Port and then you've got the part goes up to Penyan. It's just a beautiful place. And I'm so grateful to be here. I very happily identify as coming from the Finger Lakes. I call it the Napa of the East when I talk to people from other parts of the country. And uh, it's really uh, a blessing. And I'm, and I'm deeply, deeply grateful to be able to be a part of the community here. Has anyone ever shared with you um, there's a theory about the Finger Lakes that this is where God put his hand on the earth. Um, yes. And that's how like the lakes were shaped. That's something that was part of the folklore growing yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that so cool? And you know, the remarkable thing is that actually comes from Native American uh, yes. tradition. And then mm -hmm. you see that way, they didn't have airplanes. balloons. <laughs> 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 like, wow. That's a lot of very interesting algebra and trigonometry that they must have used, as well as, you know, talking amongst themselves, as we would say, mm -hmm. in the house from the Seneca to the Mohawk, to understand the geography in such a way that that concept uh, came to be. And it's absolutely true. Have, have all of you ever been in an airplane and had that perspective of looking at the Finger yes. Lakes? You haven't, you know, try to plan a flight if you're going to go someplace to do it when it's daylight and you can see it because that is exactly what it looks like. And it really yeah, does. It's stunning. That's our, our pride logo. Yeah. You know, it's got the- It's our rainbow finger the lakes. Yeah. 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 I will happily send you we'll one. We'll get you one. Absolutely. And we'll get you one of our fancy this year only designs too. Yes. Oh. <laughs> and I'll send you a donation. <laughs> Yeah, we love getting we love getting everybody on board with this. Um, and right. actually, part of the work that we do through the LGBTQ program is going out and um, educating organizations and professionals and parents and other adults through what we call our safe zone trainings, um, which are always free to, or to the organizations who host us. So a lot of the people that we train are actually allies to the community. So we like to start our training by asking them who their LGBTQ hero or heroine is. Um, someone that they want to grow for or look up to or they feel is iconic. So who's your LGBTQ hero? Oh, wow. Well, uh, you know, I'll just tell you the first person that popped into my mind. And then I bet after we get off of this session, I'll think of 30 more that I wish that I had considered. But I'm going to go with Florence King, who wrote, and it's going to take me a second, but uh, she was part of the early literature of the 60s and 70s and uh, wrote these coming of age, coming out stories that I cherished growing up because in reading them, I recognize I wasn't alone or this other woman. Uh, mm -hmm. with my had the relationship that, you know, we weren't the only two people in the whole world that, that had this and trying to understand what it is. We didn't have a name for it or anything like that. So uh, Florence King's first book, and it will come to me in a second, the name of it. Um, Audre Lorde was also a very, very mm -hmm. important on me, um, not just the literature, but the person and, and her experience uh, and her kind of autobiographical account 
uh, again, the, the title is escaping me, but, but those two people jumped to mind as the people that I very much looked up to. Billie Jean King, after she came out, mm -hmm. and so, you know, wow, like someone who's important, has accomplished so much and is so great, you know, wow, like she's like me, you know, made me feel like maybe I was okay. In that long journey of, of how we come to understand ourselves and recognize, yes, we're okay. Of course we are, but we do need people to look up to, to verify that when you come from backgrounds where you don't have, and especially, you know, I'm in a time capsule. I'm talking about the late 60s and 70s when I was emerging uh, as a young person and then a young adult, that it was far, I think, far more challenging to uh, come to that understanding than it is now. However, there are many people in many parts of our country, in our district, even in, Finger Lakes that I am sure have that same struggle because they're in families or communities or environments where there isn't the understanding and, and the acceptance. And, and so uh, I'm not saying it's all over with now just because times have changed. I think we have to recognize it's still very much a part of us. And I love that you said, oh my gosh, we're not alone in this because Mitch and I run programs for our youth called YANA, which stands for You Are Not Alone. So I love that that message is continuing to be perpetuated throughout every single person we've spoken with because it is such an important message to bring home to our kiddos who are going through these struggles and feel like they might be by themselves. And I, like you, am a cradle Catholic. So I went through my discovery in the Catholic church. Um, so I, I can sympathize with those feelings of isolation where, you know, this came kind of out of nowhere to you. And then you have to kind of do that, that identity crisis tango for a little bit and, um, so I love hearing even you bring up the message that oh, we're not the only ones, we're not alone, um, and that it is something that you can grow together through um, because it's such an important message that we bring to our, our the people we serve, our community. Absolutely, that, and I'm so grateful that you do it. Thank you. Um, I also, speaking of our youth, wanted to talk to you about an issue that's really important to all of our agency. So um, directly through the LGBTQ program and through our other programs that work with survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking as well, mm -hmm. um, a lot of, we encounter a lot of vulnerable people and youth who are seeking community and relationships often through the internet. Um, and I know that your expertise is in cybersecurity. So I was wondering what your thoughts were when it comes to protecting youth while still maintaining their ability to access LGBTQ inclusive sites on social media. Yeah. Well, I think uh, what we should have for everybody is uh, much more focused and intentional information literacy, uh, digital literacy, computer literacy. And you know, these are concepts of how you use the technology and the platforms and how the internet works, advertising as why we can post for free on Facebook or use Google or something like that. We all need to understand what the business models are underneath it and what the technical security risks are, as well as these uh, up the stack risks of, I don't know, let's say Russian interference creating false profiles and then creating and fomenting discord uh, you know, as a way to destabilize politics of the United States, that they would create these sites that it's not Americans talking about Islam or anti-Islam, it's Russians trying to create discord and, and foment this kind of unrest. Um, we need that education from very young ages all the way up. And, and what is so important about it is that it's not just about technology or Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever, uh, or Fortran or Atran or you know any of those either. It's about taking basic critical learning skills and applying them to the internet. So yeah, you need to learn something about how technology operates. And then you need to learn about the business models of Facebook and Instagram and Fortran and Atran and so forth. Uh, but then you apply really age old learning skills that people in the United States should still cherish because it is how you build a democracy. If you just want people to perform, then just teach them to the test. If you want people to think for themselves, you have to teach critical thinking. 
And so you put these two things together, and I think we have the kind of education that honors our culture and tradition in the United States as a democratic republic. And while I do understand the importance of testing and so forth, I do think we have erred too far on that side, and we somehow in the process, from kindergarten all up, have lost the ability to teach these basic cherished skills that we require people to have in order to discharge their obligations as citizens mm -hmm. in a democratic mm -hmm. republic. And we can build information, technical, digital literacy into that. And then I think we put people in a much better place to be able to discern what they get when they're on any of these social platforms and, and evaluate it, consider the source, learn to look it up, check out a website to see or uh, an email address to see if it's a fake or not. You know, all mm -hmm. of these little skills that you can learn and, and give you more sense of confidence in yourself, in your ability to figure those things out. And then it also gives you the confidence to be able to seek out for yourself legitimate and appropriate places where people may want to go to learn more about themselves or their communities or other ideas, uh, other political thoughts. Um, but, you know, you need the basis of understanding all of that, the, the technology, the information, the business models, how the internet works, privacy, security, it's all a part of it. And it is so necessary to have this kind of quantity in Congress. There is no one with that background there. I would be the unique first person in Congress with this kind of background in internet and cybersecurity policy, information literacy. And uh, I think it's a reason why it's so important that we get the word out about this election, not only in this district, but in the entire United States. Congress is a federal body. I can bring what people want in Missouri and California and Iowa and Texas and Nevada to Congress because it is a federal office. And we need them to recognize there is someone here who brings all of these professional background and qualities together in a way that honestly could help and make a difference to so many people's lives using the internet. Yeah, and we love that talk about representation. And actually the next question we were going to um, ask you about has to do with that representation. So I love that you brought that up um, because we've come a long way since Harvey Milk was first elected to a public office, but openly LGBTQ people only hold like 698 of our 520,000 elected offices, according to the LGBTQ Victory Institute in 2019. I looked it up. <laughs> we, we worked real hard for this. Um, and more than 300 of those people were only elected in the 2018 midterms. Um, so we feel that representation that reflects the community is important, especially in positions of power. Um, so we we're kind of curious what your thoughts and feelings were about that and how we can continue to make these opportunities possible for our community members. Well, that's a great question. I am very honored to already be uh, supported and endorsed by LPAC, which is a lesbian PAC uh, that's newly emerged on the PAC scene. Uh, <laughs> uh, I also am endorsed by NOW, which of course is you know more broad-based uh, to support women's rights. And I've been endorsed by the Victor Fund, uh, which is a fund of, uh, uh, out of uh, uh, the DCCC, Democratic, uh, Democratic Campaign Committee. <laughs> 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 I say DCCC, sometimes I have to stop and remember. Uh, con Sorry. Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. There. There we go. <laughs> um, let me say this. And it, 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 it I, I, I have not been supported by the Human Rights Commission. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every time we talk to them, they say, well, is the DCCC supporting you? Is Emily's List supporting you? There's an inside the beltway thing that, that uh, saddens me. When I went down to Washington and I spoke to members there, I said, you have been so important in my life. I did not go into politics when I left college, even though if you'd ask anyone who knew me, they thought I would. I was president of the Student Association. I was very involved in a lot of different activities, labor, civil rights, women's rights, um, nascent LGBTQ efforts. And everyone would have thought I went into politics, but uh, I knew in the year of our Lord, 1980, 81, that uh, as someone who had relationships with both men and women, that that would automatically disqualify me from mm -hmm. running for office. 
but look how much has changed. And I thanked HRC for everything that they have done to make it possible in my lifetime now to run for office and to be able to declare openly and proudly that I am in a same sex relationship and everything that we've shared about it. So the idea that they would um, ball themselves up in an inside the beltway, instead of recognizing the very people that, you know, would, would, would cut off a finger to thank them figuratively. Uh, it, it doesn't feel right to me. It's part of what's wrong with our politics. And if there's anyone who watches your show and wants to send a message to the human rights uh, campaign or to Emily's list, same thing, that, that people in this district think that's wrong. And especially for someone like myself who's out and for exactly what you said, show them those numbers again. Why, 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 why wouldn't they want to support, you know, someone who is right in the pocket of what they stand for and what they advertise for and what they f raise money for? They, they, they should be honoring people like us who are running and we're running for the betterment of this entire district on very basic bread and butter issues of affordable health care and good education and infrastructure, better jobs, the environment. We're running for everybody. We're, we're committed to anti-racism as we're ex experiencing now in the aftermath of the death of George Floyd and all of the unrest. We are running for working and middle-class people across this district to have a better life. And the idea that, you know, maybe because uh, one doesn't, uh, you know, has all of these metrics that they use to evaluate whether they're going to give or not, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like the organization that I've contributed to in the past. So I, that may have been a different answer than you expected me to give, but I'm just being honest with you about where it's at. Well, we appreciate that. Um, again, Tracy, thank you so much for taking the time to visit with us and to talk about LGBTQ equality. Your work is so appreciated um, by all of us. Um, the last thing I'd like to ask you is during this time of social distancing, how are you staying connected with your community and celebrating Pride Month? Ah, yes. Well, happily, I worked in technology before I got into politics. So the transition to using online uh, programs, materials, platforms was more or less seamless for me. And, you know, my campaign team has been terrific about it. Uh, we have actually been able to reach out to people in a silver lining kind of outcome that maybe we couldn't have reached because when you're just face to face, you don't know who you're not reaching out to, but uh, as more people had to resort to being online in order to be connected, uh, I think we were able to bring people into our Tuesday with Tracy talks uh, that we have had ongoing since the middle of March and uh, some of the other activities that have allowed us to stay connected even as we physically have to stay apart. Uh, I just did a little video for Corning Pride, a uh, mm -hmm. few more minutes got on today and uh, I look forward to celebrating with people if it has to be socially distanced then we'll do it that way if it has to be online we will do it that way but we are all working together to be sure that we're going to be healthy and safe and that we are together going to work on making this district this Finger Lakes region this country a better place and thank you for doing your part for doing exactly that especially for the Finger Lakes thanks thanks so much